Hi, thank you for joining us for Oregon Horse Council's new Oregon Horse Life segment, formerly known as Know Your Industry. We updated our name so folks could find us better online. Our past videos have been getting great traction and we appreciate everyone who's watched them and shared them. Today we are joined with Kim McCarroll, one of our old friends who've been with OHC since I think the beginning. <laughs> and she's the owner of Northwest Trail, or yeah, Northwest Horse Trail. Um, she's the wonderful author of many books that I see folks buying out and about when we're at expos and events across the state. So thanks for joining us, Kim. Well, thank you. Thanks for the invitation. <laughs> we are here to talk about trail riding today. I know the weather is getting nice. It's supposed to be, I think, 85 here in Central Oregon. Um, folks are eager to get out after weeks of being, staying home. I guess we're not quarantined, we're just staying home um, and not being able to get out and about. But the big thing we want to start with is what trails can you actually go ride at? There's a lot of misinformation out there that everything's closed or everything is open or if you can get to the trail, you can ride it regardless of whether it's closed or not. So can you fill us in on a little bit of factual information about going trail riding in Oregon? Sure, I'll try. Um, it's, it's actually really complicated and the answer varies a lot depending on your location. Um, so, for example, um, in Northwest Oregon, all of the BLM trailheads are closed. In Southern Oregon, some are open like the uh, Sterling Mine Ditch, but others like the Cathedral Hills system are closed. Um, and in Central Oregon, all of the BLM trailheads are open. I think it depends on how many people live in the area and how many people typically would go to that area, how big the trailhead is, that sort of thing. So uh, if the place can't accommodate the kind of crowds they would anticipate, they've kept it closed. Um, the governor has just allowed some state parks to open. Uh, for example, Tryon Creek in Portland is open, but MacIver State Park is closed. Um, Willamette Mission in Salem is open. Um, Hardy Creek, uh, the Malala River Recreation Area is closed, but people are using it anyway. Uh, <laughs> there aren't any gates on the, the trailhead, so um, it's, that seems to be getting some pretty heavy use. Mount Pisgah in Eugene is open, but Elijah Bristow is closed. So I mean, it's, it's really all over the map. Uh, some county parks are open. Others have said they're going to stay closed until the stay home orders are all lifted. Um, on the National Forest, all of the trailheads are closed. But the forest itself and the trails are open. So if you can find a place that you can park and turn your trailer around, you're golden. You can ride it anywhere <laughs> you want. Um, but, you know, if I would urge you not to congregate. I mean, don't, don't park. 10 trailers in the same spot, uh, try to spread things out because uh, when the Forest Service sees a big congregation of cars in one spot, they think, oh gosh, we're not getting the good social distancing here. Mm -hmm. Now, I know when we're on horseback, we are socially distant. <laughs> we are more than six feet apart. <laughs> exactly. There's no way that you can be close, uh, close to each other, but um, you know, most of these rules are put together for people who are on foot. And so, and, and that's obviously, that's the majority of the people who are um, gonna be out there. So mm -hmm. um, we have to fall under those rules, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I understand that some, count, that some coastal counties are closed to visitors and they're not allowing anybody to come in and stay overnight. Um, I don't know that they can close the beaches, um, but, the counties are definitely wanting people to stay away. So the coast is probably a good place to, to stay away. Their biggest concern is um, people coming from other areas where the infection rate is higher and bringing it to their area. So I don't blame them for being a little touchy about uh, having people come in from other areas. I think that's actually one of the issues. I know I've had people say, well, can't, you know, we're locals. Can't we just use our local trails? And the fact is there's no way to monitor those trails to know only locals are using them once they're open. And I think that's a big concern is people coming from, you know, other states or, you know, I'm, I'm seeing, you know, there's hot spots still up in the north, north of us in Washington. And if those people here, our trails are open and they all flood down here, and, you know, even if you attempt social distancing, they're still going to have to possibly stop for gas or something and, and be in contact with someone. So it's been unfortunate, but I think that's a lot of the reason they're not opening trails up more widely. Yes. Yeah. yeah they, I think the, 
they want to, both the land management agencies and the governor's office really want to do this slowly and do it right. So I know that most of us are kind of chafing at getting out. I'd like to be doing a little bit more, but um, you know, try to try to abide by the rules and, and keep um, other people safe. Yeah. And there were also a lot of these trails that were having serious parking lot issues prior to the COVID virus. I mean, I, I remember um, I was at a Backcountry of Horsemen of Oregon conference, I think it was two years ago, and one of the Deschutes County land managers was talking about the, the number of users was growing so exponentially. They couldn't even um, deal with parking lots. People were parking illegally on the road. They were blocking um, corridors that might be used for emergency vehicles. And so we all know that we have, we have very popular scenic areas in Oregon and they're going to get flooded if people, if they get wide open and people can move around again. So. Exactly. That's the problem. Um, I think a couple of things that are going to be worth keeping in mind is that everybody would like to reopen things, but it has to be done in an orderly fashion. So um, the governor is relying really heavily on the advice of health experts. Um, they're looking at the capacity of the agencies to handle having more places open. And um, they're looking at community readiness, uh, that what we were talking about earlier about not having visitors swamp small towns. Um, the bottom line is even when things start to open up, we're not returning to normal. This is not gonna be the good old days. There are still gonna be restrictions. There are still gonna be concerns about infection rates and so forth. So. Um, we just have to be patient and um, do what we can to keep our neighbors safe from, from infection. It, you know, it, it, wearing masks is not something you do for yourself. It's something you do for everybody around you. So um, it's going to be, I think things are going to be weird until they get a vaccine and we have widespread testing. Yeah. And it's going to be a while too. You're off maybe a year and a half. Yeah, unfortunately it is. So it's important for us to all do our part during this. Um, so you said it's super confusing. There's no, there's no rhyme or reason, it seems like. I mean, I think there is, but of which, which trails are opening. Is there anywhere to go to get a list of this or anyone working on that? Well, if you look at my Facebook page, <laughs> you, know, you would think that um, asking each other is the right answer. Oh. <laughs> of course, it's not. It's the blind leading the blind. So. Um, you know, the most important thing you can do is to go to the land managers themselves. And that's not easy to do. Because I, for example, yesterday I was doing a search um, for the Malala River Recreation Area to see if BLM had decided to open it up or not. And I couldn't find anything online that said whether it was open or closed. So you have to call BLM and ask the person who answers the phone, whether it's open or not. Um, now, I was on a conference call yesterday with the um, uh, Office of Outdoor Recreation, the statewide office, and they are trying to put together a list of all of the websites that have things listed for all the various land managers. And they said it would probably be about 15 URLs, but um, at least that will give us a place we can go to get uh, that information. So hopefully, they'll get that prepared in the next week or so and I will post it all over Facebook so folks can um, hopefully find it easily. Yeah and you mentioned your Facebook page when you post something you know it's accurate um, you, you you're not just posting willy-nilly so um, no, no, I don't, it's I good to follow you or I post them. Yeah so if you really want to know your go to your page and kind of go back through your feed and you could probably find some great information um, but just don't necessarily trust the word of somebody who thinks they know without verifying because you don't want to get there and get stuck you know, at some gated trailhead and you can't turn your trailer around. <laughs> yeah. So when you do get to a chance to get back out again, um, I know something we've, we've talked about and I've, you know, many trail conferences is um, parking lots. You know, we've had issues with people parking in equestrian parking um, that are, you know, not horse users. Um, but then when the horse user areas are established, they always want to make sure that we're not leaving behind our, you know, hay or horse poop or anything else. So is there some good parking lot tips you can give to help people out as well as they start going back out? Sure. 
Um, one of the things that um, the land managers and the governor's office are really concerned about is where people park in parking areas. They don't want them to park close together. They want you to basically keep one parking space um, between you and the next car uh, so that you've got social distancing. Well, that's easy to do with a horse trailer. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much we couldn't we couldn't park within six feet of each other if we wanted to. But um, you know, spreading things out a little bit is a good idea. Um, I always tell people when you go to a parking area, always park facing out so that it'll be hard for somebody to block you in. Because if you know if a parking area gets overrun um, by hiker cars and, and mountain biker cars, they're probably gonna overflow into the horse parking area. So uh, try to park so that you can't be blocked um, if somebody parks too close to you. And probably the most important thing is take your manure home with you. Um, you know, I know that there are people who think you could just pick it up and throw it in the bushes and that's good enough. But, and if one person does that, yeah, it'll decompose. But if 50 people using that parking lot do it, it's not going to decompose. It's just going to pile up and make a big mess and it's unsightly. And not a good idea. Um, it's I agree it's better than leaving it in the parking lot, um, but it's still not a good idea. So the best thing you can do for the environment and um, for the image of equestrians is to take your manure home because you will be remembered for what you leave behind. And we know that you know we're always in a, an area of trying to defend equestrian trails and make sure that we at least maintain the trails we have. I think as an industry, we know we might not get a lot of new trails added, um, but it's very important as a user group and probably one of the smallest user groups that we as, are as respectful as possible. So there's no ammunition they can use against us to say, we're taking this trail away because you guys park where you don't, aren't supposed to, you've blocked other people in, you're leaving your trash behind. And so we just need to make sure horse people aren't here. Um, and that those are some conversations that have come up before. So it's very important that all equestrians do everything they can to give our industry the best reputation out there when they're using our parking lots and trails. Yes. You know, when I was a kid, I was a Girl Scout. And, you know, Girl Scouts go on field trips and stuff, and you wear your little Girl Scout mm -hmm. uniform. And our leader used to sit us down before we would go out in public and say, when you're wearing your, your Scout uniform and you go out in public, people don't see your face they see a Girl Scout in uniform. And if you behave badly, that reflects badly on all Girl Scouts. Well, I think that goes double for equestrians. If we're out there on the trail and we're not behaving, if we're behaving badly, um, that reflects on all equestrians. And if we're, we don't clean up after ourselves in the parking lot um, and those kinds of things, that just gives all equestrians a bad image. So I just hope everybody realizes that when you go out in public, you're an ambassador for the entire equestrian community and we need to behave that way. That's a great point. Something everyone should definitely remember. So when you get out of the parking lot, you're on your horse, you're taken off on a trail for the first time in months, maybe. <laughs> what are some great tips? I know you were involved with um, a wonderful video last summer about trail etiquette. Um, when bikers, hikers, equestrians are all using the same trail, um, what are some good tips to to properly pass each other and give each other the respect um, on the trail? Okay, well, you know, everybody's familiar with that, um, that big triangle that has horses, uh, or mountain bikes yield to hikers and horses, and hikers yield to horses, and horses don't yield to anybody. <laughs> uh, and I know some equestrians who interpret that to, to mean everybody should get off the trail for us. But that really isn't what it means. What it really means is when you encounter somebody on the trail, you guys need to stop and talk to each other and decide what's the safest way to pass. And because the equestrian is the most vulnerable um, member of any interaction like that, it's up to the equestrian to decide what's the most, um, what's the safest. So if you're on a rocky area, um, where you really can't um, get off the trail, then sure, other people need to get off the trail for you. Um, and typically they should get off on the downside because horses are less spooked by things below them than things above them. Uh, but if you 
on terrain where that just really isn't the safest way to do it, don't hesitate to ask people to move to the upside or to ride your horse out around them if that's the safest thing to do. Um, you just really have to look at the terrain that you're on and um, make a decision about what's the, the safest way to pass each other. Um, the most important thing is to be friendly and just talk to people. Um, I know that a lot of mountain bikers and some trail runners like to travel with earbuds and it makes it really hard to interact with them because they they don't hear you and they're looking down so they don't see you. Um, it's kind of dangerous. I wish people would recreate with just one earbud. <laughs> but <laughs> I can't control their behavior. All I can right. control is my behavior. So I try to be super friendly and um, just try to engage them in conversation because once you do that, your horse hears their voice and the horse says, oh, it's a person, nothing, nothing to really worry about. Um, but if, if you're not, if you're angry, your horse knows you're angry, but they don't necessarily know what you're angry about. So that, that makes them more tense and it puts you in danger. So it's best if you can just be friendly and relaxed and talk to the other trail users and ask them for what you need. Don't hesitate to say, well, it would really be a lot safer if you could do X. Yeah. And that's great advice too, because even if, if you're the only one that provides them that information, it might make them realize like, oh, that the next time I encounter a horse, I'm going to automatically do that. Um, you know, we have to remember that all these other users, most of them are not, not sure what to do with a large animal. They're, right. They, what they think might be the safest actually isn't the safest for us, but they just don't know any better. So we need to kindly educate them. And I really appreciate the work that you've been doing as well as many others with the Oregon Trail Coalition because I think it's one of the first times all the user groups have been coming together and sharing knowledge and compassion and information with each other and really trying to look out for the trail system as a whole. And I, I feel like when I've attended those meetings, nobody wants to exclude any user group. They wanna figure out how all the users can use the trails together. And a, a big piece of that is, is friendly conversation and getting to know the other users too. Exactly. And you know, the, the most low key way you can teach other people what to do safely on the trail is to thank them when they do it right. Oh, good point. It's just, you know, thank you so much for getting off the trail for us or thanks for stopping. I mean, even if they didn't get off the trail, if they stopped, that's something. So you can thank them for that and give them a little reinforcement that, yep, that was the right thing to do. That's great. So when you're thinking about going out, obviously before you leave your house, don't forget your, your scooper because you're not going to leave trail droppings behind. <laughs> um, you, you know, if you're going to go out and ride, you know, hopefully you've got a friend. I think trail riding is always more fun with somebody, but sometimes you just need that peace and quiet. Um, what are some good things to remember? It might've been a year now. What do you not, not forget to take with you when you go out on a ride somewhere? Well, I think the most important um, thing you can take with you is your helmet. <laughs> we all value our heads and we'd like them to stay intact. Um, always carry a cell phone and, but don't rely on it because there are going to be lots of times where you don't have cell signal and, um, or your battery goes dead or whatever. So, um, it's a great safety tool when it's working, but when it's not working, that's a problem. Uh, always carry a map, always carry a knife, carry water and snacks and, um, always, um, let's see, what was something else? Oh, a jacket, because <laughs> you never you know. know. <laughs> We're in Oregon, you never know what the weather's going to be. Yeah, and it might be uh, hot at the trailhead and freezing cold to where you end up. <laughs> exactly. Um, it's really important that you let somebody know where you are going and when you expect to be home so that they know where to go looking for you. I mean, search and rescue is happy to go out and try and rescue you, but if they don't have a clue where you are, it's going to be a lot harder. Um, and, you know, this is a little bit of a digression, but I'll bring it up anyway. When you're riding in the wilderness and you have to fill out one of those wilderness permits at the kiosk, it tells how many people are in your party and what your zip code is and all that kind of stuff. That's really useful for search and rescue. If, if you have said, you've told somebody, um, I'm going to be riding out of the XYZ trailhead and you don't come home, you can go to that trailhead and your truck is still there. They know where to start looking for you. And when you've got that wilderness permit, 
um, it gives them some idea of where to look for you. So um, I know it feels kind of big brothery sometimes, but it's really important that you fill that out. Yeah. That information is also used to indicate how many people of which type use the trails. So if you don't fill it out, equestrians get undercounted. Very important. We the land managers sure making decisions. Have. Yeah, they, they have no idea that this is a popular horse trail if the horse people don't fill out those wilderness permits. Good point. And back to the cell phones, one more thing. We with Oregon Horse Council have done a number of the technical large animal emergency rescue courses with Dr. Um, Rebecca Husted and her classes are amazing. And there's an incident more often than you realize with horses and people and you know, you can get out there and a horse trips and injures a leg or something. Even if you have your cell phone, what you want to also do is carry some kind of information on important phone numbers. Um, you might not realize you don't have your vet's emergency number or you might not have a good contact information for somebody. And unfortunately, what we see more often than not is people get enough service to get on Facebook and then they post on Facebook, oh my gosh, my horse is injured, I'm stranded out and blah, 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 blah. And then it just goes crazy viral and a million people wanna help and they give in random advice and, and you, you're out there stressed out and you don't know what to do. So I say, you know, before you go out, make sure you've got information of an emergency vet. Hopefully it's your vet because you've worked, built up a good relationship with them enough that you'd have their you know, cell phone number on a weekend, you know, that you have important numbers with you. So if you do end up in an incident, try to call out rather than posting on Facebook and getting help that way. Um, because we see that the, the amazing amount of response actually slows down and impedes help because you get so much bad information. Um, people are trying to help, but they just don't know the correct information to share. So, you know, make sure you have some good information. If you can get, you know, like you said, cell phones don't always work out there though. <laughs> a vast amount of locations. So that's where it's handy to ride with more than, you know, more than just yourself. You could send somebody back to a, an area you could get service or something as well. Um, and there's some great information that Dr. Houston has put out regarding that. And we cover it frequently and try to put more information out on our website as we've got it. So we mentioned the, the Oregon Trail Coalition. Um, well, on, I, there's yeah. a couple of things I ought to mention about cell phones. One yeah. is your cell phone doesn't do you any good if it's in your saddlebag and your horse, horse runs off. So carry it on your person. And number two, um, oh my gosh, now I've lost number two. What was it? <laughs> <Let's go. laughs> um, well, I know you can get cell phone boosters too, um, that are really affordable. My husband is a service mechanic, um, and he is often at job sites up at logging sites and he's got this really, really cheap little booster he can add to his phone and he gets service in places I couldn't imagine actually being able to call out of. Um, so there are some additional things. If you're someone who goes and rides a lot, you could probably look into something like that, which helps your service, or at least gives you ability to text message. Yes. Oh, I thought of it. Okay, so the other thing is, and this is just completely not obvious until you need it. Um, you know, we, in the old days, we, everybody had one phone number. So if you needed to reach somebody's <laughs> husband because the person you were riding with got hurt and was going to the hospital, you could just call their house. Well, now their spouse <laughs> has their own telephone number. So make sure you have your friend's spouse's telephone numbers in your phone. Yeah, good point. I think a lot of people, you know, I think about my friends and I mean, people like you, we hang out at conferences and things and I'm like, I don't know how to even get a hold of your spouse if something was to happen. Exactly. I don't even know how to reach other people. So um, good, good information. So we hope that folks are, are good about getting out and riding. If you can ride around your property or in a neighboring property, please do. Oregon Horse Council has a great program we call Get Out and Ride Oregon. Um, you join and you log your riding hours. Any time spent in the saddle that is non-competitive and non-compensated. So if you're a professional trainer, you can't count those hours. But if you're just riding around your backyard, your arena, um, you know, out on any trails, you can count those hours and then we send you prizes just for getting out and riding. So we want people to ride. We want people to utilize our trail systems. We know it's not always perfect, but as you mentioned earlier, the more proof we can provide that equestrians are using these, these locations, that we're using them respectfully, it helps our case when we're trying to defend those trails. And when those land managers have to decide, ooh, do we cut a user group or not, we need to show that equestrians are there and we appreciate that we even have that trail. 
Um, so exactly. Again, we mentioned the Oregon Trail Coalition. Can you give a brief update on what that is? Because I think it's a great group that's been helping uh, all the user groups out a lot. Um, sure. I'm, I'm sure that most of um, the people who are watching this are familiar with at least some horse groups. We've got lots of breed groups and we've got uh, Oregon Equestrian Trails and Backcountry Horsemen that focus on trail riding uh, and, and doing trail volunteer work. But there are counterparts to all of those organizations for other types of trail users, mountain bikes, um, trail runners, um, the, the handicapped, um, oh, I can't say handicapped, I think I need to say accessible. <laughs> anyway, uh, people who are, are more physically challenged, um, there are lots of organizations out there, and the Oregon um, Trails Coalition is a big tent that includes all of those people and tries to bring them all together because if you can get a whole bunch of people in the same room talking about issues, you find out that, uh, you know, these guys aren't the demons we thought they were. We really have a lot more in common than we do in conflict. So how do we work together to solve problems? Um, and it's a, a, a very effective approach that um, it also gives us a, a bigger voice, the trail riding community or the trail community in general, it gives us a bigger voice in state government, um, in our lobbying efforts at the federal level, um, and it helps to disseminate information that's useful um, to all of the, the people who like using trails in, 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 the, in Oregon. And you're, you're the representative for the equine industry on their board? On their steering committee. On right. their steering committee, great. And so they usually have an annual conference where everyone can get together, anyone can attend. Um, it's always fantastic and great food and great conversation. Obviously with the new governor's restrictions on gatherings, they are not going to be able to be meeting in person this year because that's well over 100 people who attend. Um, right. So you were saying earlier when you were chatting that there might be some webinar options and opportunities for people to get engaged with that group without leaving the comfort of their homes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The, the conference is in October, so we have some time before the final decisions have to get made. But um, the idea is we'll look at what kinds of things can we present virtually and you know, maybe do a series of webinars instead of one big conference. Uh, and there may be a few um, in-person gatherings of smaller groups to talk about specific issues. So that hasn't been decided, but it's that that's the direction that the group is leaning. And they have a great website. If you go to Oregon Trail Coalition, you can sign up for their newsletter. Um, their director sends out great information and updates, I think at least weekly, if not more often, um, yeah. with a variety of webinars and, and um, event information and things that are coming up. So it's worth tuning in on that if you're an avid trail user. Yes. So is there anything else you want to add about our trail system, getting out writing? how excited we all are to leave our homes. <laughs> yeah, we actually, uh, the Oregon Trails uh, Coalition had a steering committee meeting yesterday and we chatted with um, the Office of Outdoor Recreation's director, Kaylin O'Brien Feeney, and he gave us some really good tips that um, the Office of Outdoor Recreation, Travel Oregon, and other statewide entities are going to be uh, promoting over the, the coming weeks as as we kind of start beginning this social easing process. And they call it the six for safety. There are only six things. I think the idea is people can hold six ideas in their head. <laughs> if you give them a list of 20, probably not. But if you give them six, maybe we'll, we'll get them right. Um, the first one is know before you go. Uh, it's a good idea to check the status of the place you want to go to see, if, make sure it's open. If it's closed, don't go. And if it's mine, if it's um, if it's open, but when you get there, it's crowded. Have a plan B and go somewhere else. Um, plan ahead is number two, um, and that basically involves trying to be self-contained. Um, pack your lunch, get gas before you go, um, <laughs> use the bathroom before you go, uh, and bring the ten essentials for survival with you. Um, everybody should have that stuff in their saddlebags. And don't forget to have some hand sanitizer. Uh, they suggest carrying a mask and toilet paper with you. <laughs> um, I, I think the toilet paper is great. 
Um, as for a mask, if you don't have one, bandanas make really great um, masks while you're out riding. So you can pull it down and not use it when you, but when you need it, you can put it up. So uh, that's a good plan. Number three is stay close to home. Uh, as Brandy was mentioning earlier, um, this is not the time to travel long distances to go recreate. Um, stay as close to home as you possibly can. And uh, most places are only open for day use um, and established campsites are closed. So just to try to stay as close to home as you can. The fourth is practice social distancing. That kind of goes without saying. Um, it's a good idea to recreate only with the other people from your household. And if you do go with friends instead of family members, make sure that you um, keep enough space between you to, to be safe. Um, fifth one is play it safe. And that, that basically is um, trying to be mindful of the impact that if we get injured on the trail, we're going to have, uh, you know, we're going to take up a hospital bed and we're going to use search and rescue resources that are probably better off being used for other stuff. So uh, play it safe rather than going out and riding hell bent for leather <laughs> off of cliffs. Don't do that. Um, and the last thing is leave no trace. Uh, if you take something with you, take it home with you. Take your garbage out, um, take your manure home, and um, just remember that a lot of toilets are closed and a lot of trash facilities, you know, trash cans and stuff is not being collected. So uh, just, pre just plan to take everything back home with you and be as self-contained as you possibly can. Those are some great tips. Hopefully those are printed up somewhere. I'd love to get them added to the Oregon Horse Council website as well. Yes, I will be um, adding them to my Facebook page today and um, I'll shoot you an email with them so you can you can post it however you'd like. We'll get them out there. So for more information on all of Kim's wonderful knowledge, her books, and updates on all the trail items that she knows about statewide, um, definitely follow her on Facebook. Just NW Horse Trails or nwhorsetrails.com is her website. Um, she's posting stuff all the time. I know we share the vast majority of it on the Oregon Horse Council Facebook page as well, but following Kim directly will get you the, the latest and greatest information as she knows it. So we really appreciate you coming on today. You're our, our, our statewide trail expert and we appreciate all the hard work. People do not realize how many hours you put in on behalf of the equine industry um, to defend and, and work on our trails. So we really appreciate everything that you do. Well, thanks, Brandy. You're welcome. And we just hope you stay safe. We'll see you out somewhere again, not at an expo. I miss seeing you at expos <laughs> or all the, the shows we used to go to, um, but, but 2021, we'll, we'll meet up somewhere along the way. There you go. Sounds like a plan. All right. Have an excellent day. We appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Thanks, Brandy. Bye.